What's going on, everybody? And welcome to another episode of Disruptors in the Culture. My name is Joshua Meekins, and I'm here with my amazing co-host, Amir Smith. All and right, so are we? Are you doing the, uh, the nah, pitch? You got it, you got it, you got it. You All got right, it. cool. All right, so, you know, as we always do, we feature um, pretty much people that we know are disrupting culture, people who are kind of changing the culture in the landscape mm -hmm. of the industries that they're in, right? Um, thus far, we have had a lot of people close to us as far as in our friends and our network, our classmates, colleagues, and um, this is no exception. We usually have Josh's friends on. <laughs> so, you know, I had to step my game up and say, Josh, you're not the only person who knows cool people. So I asked my friend Brandon Pankey to come on. Brandon is the vice president of um, Live Nation Urban. And I, you, you oversee uh, business development, right, um, Brandon? But like, all right, so we know Live Nation as music and touring, right? Mm -hmm. So the average person is going to say, okay, what exactly would a vice president of business development and operations actually do? Mm -hmm. So can so, you shed some light for us? So you're asking, okay, cool. So now, um, you know, in my role, you know, let's go pre-COVID, right? So in my role, it was really, you know, developing business opportunities and partnerships and also, being on the ground and really managing the operations for the events and festivals that we did. When Live Nation Urban started in 2017, you know, I, I looked to the first three deals that we made and it'll really emphasize what I do. The first deal that we did was a, a partnership with Spotify um, to create Rap Caviar Live. Rap Caviar Live was the live extension of their Rap Caviar playlist, which at the time that we started was, you know, at 8 million followers and they wanted to take it and make it a real brand, a live brand for emerging artists and hip hop. And so we did that and we, toward that for about two and a half years. The second deal that we did or partnership that we had was with Kirk Franklin. And we partnered with Kirk on um, Exodus Music and Arts Festival in Dallas, really taking a genre that, you know, you don't necessarily see a lot of live events or festivals and creating a, a festival that sold out, you know, every year prior to COVID. Um, then the third deal that we did was a partnership with Broccoli City. Broccoli City Music Festival in DC was already established. But it was taking Broccoli City from 10,000, 11,000 capacity to what it is now, 30, 35,000 capacity, using that Live Nation infrastructure, helping to build and scale it. And then on top of that, creating and developing our own shows, our own platforms. We have the Roots Picnic. We have um, a series called Summer Block Party, which is an R&B, urban um, uh, R&B adult contemporary series um, in multiple markets. And so my role is to really manage everything from A to Z. And that's the budget, helping to book the talent. You know, making sure that, you know, when we go on sale, we have the proper marketing and that we can sell these shows out so that we don't lose money. And then on the ground, it's, you know, everything from making sure some of your friends who need comp tickets can get their comp tickets um, to, you know, <laughs> artists. That was for you, Amara. That, that's making sure <laughs> artists get on stage on time, making sure there aren't any issues with production, making sure all of our production vendors getting paid. So really, you know, everything from ideating on a show to actually having booking that show putting that show up on sale having a show and getting to that curfew of 11 or 12 o'clock at night um and making sure you have a successful show and doing that for multiple properties across the year post-covid you know we've really had to dive into to virtual so taking you know for example, we have the roots picnic that became a virtual experience with uh, michelle obama and when we all vote you know that got us you know a million plus viewers which is going to help us as we grow the brand and scale the Roots Picnic um, in future years. You know, partnering uh, with YouTube and we had an HBCU Battle of the Bands event, um, which had hundreds of thousands of views. Um, you know, we had a Juneteenth event with um, another company, Live by Live, so Live by Live, excuse me. So really that virtual, our, our live experience and making a, a more robust virtual experience um, moving forward because live streams aren't gonna go anywhere even when we come out of this and we go back to whatever normal um, is considered. So I, you know, it's, it's a multifaceted role. It's a role that keeps me busy and, um, you know, still excited about it today. So, um, yeah, the comp tickets. It's funny because <laughs> it's like you, you first meet someone and it's just like, oh, okay, cool. You come cool. And then it's like, I, you know, I know a lot of people ask shit for something. So I, I know that probably has to get tired. Right? Everybody's like, can I get tickets too? Um, <laughs> How do you, I guess it's like, it sounds like you do a lot, right? Yeah. Um, when you first, well, did, when you were a little boy, 
Mm-hmm. Was this a life you saw for yourself, like going into entertainment? Absolutely. Bigger scale. I mean, I, I was probably 10. I mean, I, I know for a fact, you know, I, I had um I had my mom give me the source and vibe and I had subscriptions at 10, 11 years old. And I remember there was a uh, there was a, a, a interview, not an interview, it was an interview, but it was a cover with Puff on it. And Puff was Bad Boy, the record label. It was Sean John, the clothing line. It was at the time Justin's, the restaurant. It was all of these things. I said, that's what I want to do. I want to have multiple, you know, empires in different industries because I love multiple things. You know, I never wanted to be constricted to just music, but I always knew I wanted to be in the in this entertainment industry, um, but more so TV and film, like content. You know, it wasn't streaming back then, but, you know, every, I love just figuring out ways to use music as sort of the center and then create those tentacles, you know, have music as the roots and grow those branches um, into various things. And so that's video, that's gaming, that's, you know, as we talked about, that's restaurants, that's, so yes, I knew from about 10, 11, this is what I wanted to do. And um, I just went from there. Like it, it was what it was. I wasn't going to be denied. Like I, I went to, uh, I went to Penn, I went to UPenn, you know what I'm saying? I wish I had a cool HBCU story, but I don't. Um, that's because that's hot right now. Um, but, uh, you know, I went to Penn, but I knew you know, when I graduated, I interned for free, you know, at, um, you know, for Mama's Boys Music Group, which is uh, Michael McAuliffe and Jerome Hips, still based here um, in Philadelphia. And I remember the flack that I got. I remember, you know, my mom, my grandma, everyone around me like, yo, you're like, you're, you know, you're smart. Like, what are you doing? Why music should be a hobby. Like, why aren't you going out and going to law school or going to med school, you know? Um, but when you love it, and this is where I, you know, when I talk to kids as a part of the educational program uh, that I also help with, but when, you know, it's about passion. What do you want to do? Like, what's going to make you 10, 20 years down the line? Because we see a lot of people that may end up and in, in sh- no, no, no shade against them, but, mm-hmm. you know, at a desk, you know, I'm gonna date myself at Xerox, you know, and you don't give a damn about what you're doing. And so I, I always wanted to make sure that I cared about what I was doing because I knew, you know, I got a work ethic. And the reason I work so hard is because I actually give a damn about what I'm doing on a day-to-day basis. So I'm really, I'm really happy you brought up the fact that, you know, like interning for free, like that's, that's, it's, that's hard. That's not something that's easy to do. Can you talk a little bit about like, you know, how that, you know, played a role on you and like how that motivated you or how you dealt with the flack that you got from family. Cause I feel like creatives and people who are entrepreneurs deal with that all the time, but you know, nobody really talks about it or advocates about, about it a little bit. Mm, mm. It, it led to mild depression being broke. I mean, I was mm. super, 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 um, man, it was crazy. Cause I would take, I would take a bus, a train, a bus, and then walk um, to be on Delaware Avenue. And that was like every day. And I just remember, you know, in, in music industry, there are no set hours. Like, you know, mm-hmm. you we got something to do. You got to be there until it's done. So it's, you know, 11 o'clock and I'm trying to figure out how to get home. I didn't, I couldn't afford a taxi. So it's like, it was all buses. It was all trains. It was people looking at me crazy. Shout out to, you know, there was um, my, my, my girlfriend at the time was like paying for chilies and, you know, giving me a couple dollars to make sure I was cool. And so, you know, there was, there was, you know, I always had support from friends, but it was just not support from, not a lot of support from family. They always wanted the best for me. They knew, they just saw me taking a different route. Um, And it was just a struggle. Like it was, it was, um, but it was, but it was like, it was worth it. It was something that I knew I wanted to do. And they had me working on, you know, Josh, something that I'm working on today, which is called Dash, Mm -hmm. that's that's Heights, which is a music education program that myself, Mm -hmm guys I was talking about Michael McAuliffe and Jerome Hibbs working on like I thought I was going to learn how to be an a r or how to write a song and they were like no nah, we need this um so it was all on a different path which, mm-hmm. which I'm at now um but it it's something that is not for the meek or, or or weak type of individual like I just I really stress this if you really want it there are going to be moments where it's just you and they're, you know, the people that you love and they're closest to you, they may not, you know, want this. And, and it may not even come from a negative place. It may come from a place of I've struggled. So I don't want you to struggle, particularly because I helped you. You know, you're in college now. I was the, you know, probably the second person from my family in college. You know what I mean? So they were like, they were looking at me as, you know, I don't want to say like a golden child, but I was looked at as like, yo, you're the person that's, you know, 
I want to brag on you. And this is just, now here, this is old black stuff. I just want to brag on you. I want to be like, yeah, my son's a lawyer. My son's a doctor. Mm-hmm. Like, that's old black. You know, they love, you know. Um, you can't, you know, cl- I, I call it classically trained black. Like, <laughs> yeah. you want to brag on you. And you can't brag if you say your son coming out of Penn is, is interning down on Delaware Avenue. Um, you know what I'm saying? Like, I can't brag on that. And so it, it was just, it was me. It was like, I, I knew where I wanted to be. I knew where I was going. And man, it was, uh, you know, I don't, I don't know everyone's faith on here, but it was like Job. Like I had to really like walk by, you know, walk by faith, not by sight and, and continue to do so on things that I, I think of today. That's crazy. What did you major in in college? Communications and African-American studies. Wow. wow. Okay. So you really had to intern. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Because you didn't have those internships built into, um, they weren't built into, you know, your like senior years and things like that. Well, no, they weren't, but I, I still, so one of the things I'll also say, I hope there are young people listening to this, um, is that I networked, I use college to network. Like, you know, I didn't get a phone college, you know what I'm saying? Or, you know, I had like a, what was it, 2.9, 3.0? Like I didn't, I wasn't there to really all the classes, I was there to network. Like my, one of my professors, and this is the blessing of being in somewhere like Penn, one of my professors, and this I'll date myself again, was the vice president at AOL at the time. Mm. And big deal. So I went up to him and I had a, uh, I look at it now, I had a business plan, probably like a 30 page business plan on this entertainment company that I would start. And here's another, one. I, you know, I, uh, I went to him and he was like, all right, well, I'm going to get you a meeting with Warner Brothers. And I was like, okay. And I didn't check my email. And he set that meeting up and they were waiting for me in New York and I never went. And I was like, never again will I miss an email, check, like not check something at the right time, never again. So I went back to him and he was like, well, look, I'm going to give you one more shot. You have a choice of a summer internship. You can go to MTV or go to um, Sony. And I was like, I'll do MTV. Um, Cause at the time for me, MTV was more of a media company where I could still learn music, but then also learn, potentially learn television and film, even though they put me in like satellite radio at the time but I learned Pro Tools there. But in any event, I was, I did get to intern, but I was going from Philly to New York um, three days a week, waking up at like 3.30 a.m. because I had to take, again, the 57, I had to take the bus to the train. Then, I, you know, I, I wasn't, I was getting on the regional rail, then getting on the New Jersey transit just to get there by 8.30 um, in the morning. And then walk, I walked from 30, you know, if you know Penn Station to New York, walk from 33rd to, to 50, 58th every day because I couldn't necessarily, I was like confused over the subway system at that time. <laughs> uh, so I just walked. Um, but that like built something in me, you know what I'm saying? Because people were like, you really come from Philly? You're coming from Philly like these three days to, to intern here? Like, yeah. And was still beating the other interns there um, to be there on time and leaving late. You know what I mean? I wouldn't get back till midnight, 1 a.m., um, a lot of times, you know what I'm saying? But it was just the experience. So for me, um, you know, I don't forgot the question, but, but it's just, uh, you know, it's just about, uh, learning. And I use, you know, to your point, Amir, I do remember like, now I wasn't built in internships. I had to create opportunities for myself. And I think in this new era, in this new age, these kids now, like, it's like, I want to, you know, my YouTube got to, I got to get X amount of views or TikTok, if I, you know, I, it's got to reach X amount of views or X amount of followers, you know, and I made it. And there's a, there's something missing. There's a disconnect sometimes when it comes to like work and like, you know, doing the fucking work. And, and, and so it's, it's frustrating, but it's, you know, I, I know what it takes. I think Josh, you know what it takes. Amira, you know what it takes. And, and it's, it's just us helping this next generation understand the, the amount of work that goes into really fulfilling the dreams that you have. Wow. You're from what part of Philly? Well, let's see. Let's see. I grew up uh, 13th, 13th of Wyoming. Um, but then I moved out, you know, here's my, <laughs> I moved out to uh, Sheltonham, moved out to, to uh, but on the Philly side, right on the edge, I'm still Philly. You know what I mean? I, I'm trying to get some cred somewhere, but like I'm still, uh, on Philly. Uh, but not 13th of Wyoming until I was 13. So you, um, so you were, were you a scholarship kid? Just because, you know, there's a, there's an idea of kids who come from, you know, somewhere that's not like, like I'm from Strawberry Mansion, you know what I mean? You're from technically like Logan, North Philly, 
right? So it's like, what, how do you, do you like, was Penn a thing of like a scholarship or? I'm still paying no loans. It was, it was uh, 50%. It was a 50% scholarship. Um, um, so I'm still paying those loans. So now it wasn't scholarship. It wasn't like a full ride. I could have, if I would have went to another school, gotten a full ride. Um, but this was one of those things where I had to like, man, I, when I think about it, because I, I wanted to go to NYU and I got accepted to NYU. Um, but my mother, you know, people around me, like I tried to give them something. They were like, you know, go to Penn, it's Ivy League. I, I didn't give a damn about any of that. Like I was like, I want to go to NYU. But then I think about it and you just never know life, right? So the year I went into, um, went into college was uh, September, 2001 um, was when I was going to school. I can't imagine, cause I know me, I, would I have been exploring mm. around at that time? Like, cause school would have been, you know, that was 9-11, that was like, who knows? You know what I mean? I think about those kind of things. So, you know, I was where I was supposed to be, but no, I didn't get a scholarship to answer your question, a full scholarship. Ah, well, I worked, okay. worked, I, had to, I worked at Annenberg Theater. Ah, so, can, you, can, um, go ahead, Josh. I was like, talk about, I, I know you, you talked about this, you like sprinkle it a little bit, but your network. I know I've been, I've been having conversations with people a lot lately about, you know, how, yes, I went to school, graduate, my communication degree very much like you ended. I had a media, media production uh, specification with that. So for me, it was like, great, I'm happy I have this degree, but the network that I gained and that I've been using in my, in my career has really kind of taken it to the next level. And would you say that that applies in this situation too? I, I can see that from what, <laughs> the story that you had so far as like, the grind and the hustle has always been there, but that next piece. Yeah, I, I, I joked with somebody, uh, you know, like a year robot, and I'll tell you why. Like it was just like everything was kind. of, I don't want to say it was placed in front of me, but like you know, I got that internship because I went up to that teacher. There was I uh, one of my classes uh, at Penn was with uh, Michael Eric Dyson, and he brought in a guest to one of the classes just to watch Deanna Williams. And I approached Deanna Williams, um, who is a celebrity media coach. For those that don't know, media coach used to be a, a radio uh, show personality here in Philly. Just a phenomenal woman. She's actually running the uh, African American Museum and not running, but the head of the board there um, in Nashville that just opened up. Everybody should check that out as well. But she was just there. I didn't know this woman. I went up to her, approached her, said, I really want to be a part of this industry. And, and we're, this is what I did that a lot of people don't do. And they get irked with me. People want to network. And I'll give you my email and you email me once and I don't respond. And that's it. Like, well, well, they ain't email. Like, not that I might be busy or, you know, whatever, whatever. And, and, and I need to do a better job, I think. Just, you know, no matter how busy I am, making sure that I, I pay it forward. But it's the people that email maybe two, three times that will get that response. And I was very respectful in following up. And Deanna introduced me to Michael and Jerome and Mama's Boys who then introduced me to their business manager, um, Sean G, who needed an assistant. And that was the, the real start of, of my career. So for me, it's always about networking, but it's also about, you have to have the work um, as a part of the networking. Because there's a lot of people, and I don't want to say a lot of people in Philly, but there's a lot of people that network and don't have the work to do any of the net shit that they're talking about. And it's frustrating. Like Deanna, when I went up to Deanna, I had already worked at MTV. I had done things. I continued to do things on camp. I did things to show that I was serious. And so it, it, you can't just go to a networking event or say I'm networking and don't put in the work behind what you're doing because it's just fruitless at that point. And you're fraudulent. And so it's very important it's very important that when you're networking, that you're actually working. Because as Amira, I know Amira probably gets people coming up to her. You know, you worked at the film office, Amira, and they probably went up and they were like, yeah, I'm trying to make a film. Like, all right. And have you done a treatment? Have you, you know, conceptualized? Like, have you done any parts of a script? What, like, what have you done to, to make this happen? I don't know. I was looking at you to, to you, know, you know, help me. And then you may even help them. And then they still don't do the work. And so I, networking without work is a, it's just a net, yeah, empty net. Uh, f- funny story. That's how me and Tony met. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say. <laughs> I was at the film office and Tony, um, one of my friends I grew up with, her cousin 
it's Tony's uncle. And he was like, you got my nephew, Tony, da, 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 got an old series old head. I said, okay. And then Tony like DM'd me yeah. one time. And then I was like, oh, okay, cool. And he didn't really have an ex. He just said, this is what I'm doing. And I said, oh, that's great. But he didn't really ask for anything. And I didn't know. And it just yeah. ended. And it, it just languished, right? And then his, his 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 uncle, I would see him out at like, you know, the, my girlfriend's family stuff. And he'd be like, you got to get with him. And then next thing I know, about a year later, me and Tony are in a business class together. And Tony was mm-hmm. like, man, you ain't nothing get with me. And I said, but you ain't asked for nothing, bro. And then we became fast friends. We started collaborating on stuff. And then that's how everything happened. But I was like, Tony, one time. You only hit me one time. Like, what? So that's I can, I can attest to that. <laughs> Imagine if me and Tony didn't cross paths again. Like, that right. wouldn't be here. Yeah. yeah. You know? Yeah. Yeah. So um now you okay, so you at just right now you've laid out a lot, right? And your so your work path on from UPenn to internship into working Delaware Avenue and then you became an assistant to Sean G. So some people don't know who Sean G is. Who's Sean? Sean G is the president of Live Nation Urban. He is a partner in Maverick, which is the world's largest artist management firm. Um, and now he is also the one of the founders in Blackstream Live, which is a new uh, live stream network in partnership with Twitch that just got announced uh, on Friday. Um, so, you know, he is somebody that's a major player in this industry, you know, top 100 in Billboard executives, you know, whole thing. Um, at the time, he was business management. Um, and, you know, for those that don't, business management is managing the finances uh, for artists. But he did have Jill Scott and The Roots as artist management clients. And so I came into that working on the business management for, um, at the time we had Kanye West and it was the Roots and Jill. So it was like, those are the three, we had some others, but those were the three, you know, main clients. Then, you know, I came in at a really great time because we started transitioning to tour budgeting and tour management away from just, you know, paying bills and making sure insurances are good, but like managing tours. And so, you know, that's what I learned. That's where like my, really my, my bread and butter came in at was learning how to put together a tour from beginning to end, learning how to, you know, who are the, who's a crew that you got to hire? What's, how do you budget? What are, what are guarantees for it? How do you budget a, a 30 city tour? Um, and my first tour that I did by myself was 2007, uh, Queen Latifah. Uh, she was doing jazz at the time at like House of Blues around the country. And I, did not do the greatest job, but it was like, what I will say is that Sean gave me the ability to learn and learn from those mistakes. And I, you know, haven't made them, I don't think, haven't made them since that point. So, um, you know, from that point, we then took on, um, you know, we partnered with uh, the management for money um, because Kanye's manager at the time partnered with Cortez Bryant, G. Roberson, Cortez partnered together. And then it was working with Wayne on his big arena tours, 08, 09. This was when Wayne was like, Wayne. Um, and I was a part of that. And then I had to work on, Wayne had these like younger artists that he had just signed. And, you know, I was like, who is Aubrey Graham? Why are we working with somebody from Canada? And, you know, I was working with Aubrey in clubs, like when he was learning how to tour, like in 250, 300 person capacity clubs and building from there. So it was Drake, it was Nikki, it was Wayne. And then from there, probably 2014, we combined the business management firm with the artist management firm to form a full service firm, which was then purchased by Live Nation. Um, And it was formed under Maverick. Um, And then my role slightly, you know, it changed. I was now director of touring um, and business development for, you know, everybody's artists. So those artists, um, G-Eazy and T.I. at the time and a few others um, that I worked on. And then 2017, um, that's where Sean, you know, had the idea for Live Nation Urban and then brought me over to the promoter side um, in, in the role that I'm in now. But if you, when I look back at that, you know, when I interned, still working on an educational program, so that's nonprofit, then went into business management, then went into artist management. Now I'm on the promoter side. And like, you know, that's knowledge on a bunch of different levels, you know, for, for this industry. So it, it really... You know, that's why I say I like I feel like a robot sometimes. You know what I'm saying? Like I just I know I know some shit. I don't know everything, but I know I know some shit. You know what I'm saying? And so I'm super blessed for all that. So 
knowing so much and having to juggle so much, how do you keep up? What is your, like, what's your morning routine like? <laughs> what's my morning routine like? Uh, I get smoothies every day. I don't drink coffee. I've never had coffee in my life, right? Like, um, and I know that's everybody's like, get up and go. I swear to God, I get a smoothie every day. That's like my, my coffee. And then I just like, I just balance my day, man. Like, I just, I know what I have to get done. The problem is, and here's what they don't tell you, which I'm sure y'all know. Once you get to a certain level, you got so many Zooms and calls. Like, when do you have time to actually work? Like, the shit is so frustrating because I, you know, that's what I do, Amir. How do you manage your time? I just get on Zooms and then see how much energy I got after for the rest of the day to get some work done and then wake up and rinse and repeat. Like, you know, it's so different now because it's, I, it's so many calls and then there are calls to prep for the other calls and I'm like why are we, I just want to do something like I, you know I'm, I'm a I'm a worker you know what I mean like I you know I, I feel like I'm a, a CEO but I'm also like I want to get shit done I, it'd be too many calls for me but um and it was something there was a not to say any there was an article in Fast Company years ago that I read and it was a, a CEO as a woman I cannot remember her name but she has this rule and her rule is, if I'm meeting you one-on-one -on -one, or if I have a, a call with you, now Zoom, 15 minutes. She said, you know, we are meeting for 15 minutes only. If you can't succinctly get out what you got to say in 15 minutes, then we don't have, have to have a conversation. And I really take that to heart. Like, I was like, I'm stealing that. I don't know if people want to listen to me, but I'm taking that. And that's something that I, I try to do, like 15, 30 tops because there's work, there's, we have to get work done. And I, we can't just sit on the phone. You know, I, I'm not even a big small talker. I, I need to get better at that. So, you know, yeah, that's how I, ba I don't balance it. I don't balance it. How about that? There, there's your answer. <laughs> it, it's so crazy that you say that because like, when you think about it, like my work, I, I can't lie, can't lie to you. My work day is like 8 a.m. till maybe 12, 30, 1, 30 Zoom calls. Like call with this person, call with that person, meeting about this, meeting about that. So by the time it's like three or four o'clock when you're supposed to be, you know, winding down, you're just now starting to get mm -hmm. your work done. Yep. It's, it's crazy. <laughs> it's absolutely yeah. crazy. It's crazy. It's too much. So, um, all right, Brandon, you are, because Josh went and did some digging, right? He did some Googles on you to prepare, you know, a little recon. <laughs> Wait, what'd you say? Nothing. Go ahead, Josh. Go ahead. Go ahead, Amir. What? <laughs> <laughs> so he did some Googles. So he pulled up, you know, you, you're involved with Blues Babe Foundation. Of course, Dash, Destined to Achieve Successful Heights. Um, of course, your Live Nation. What, with all the work that you do already, you have a lot of philanthropic work and like boards and things you sit on. What are what are the other things that you have? Like what's Blues Babe? Um, you talked about Dash a little bit. You like sure. introed it a little bit, but... No, I'll go into both of those. Blues Bay Foundation is Jill Scott's foundation that really supports the arts, specifically in North Philly and in Camden. Um, and it's really, you know, passion of hers. It's something that I just just run. And, you know, I don't know how I got that's how I'm doing that, too. But I'm just running. But we have a camp every year, Camp Jill Scott. Um, that's phenomenal. It's a week to two week camp. And, you know, kids are taking, these are day camps. We haven't done anything overnight, but we bus kids outside of Philly. Um, sometimes they're in the Chamonix. Sometimes they're in other places. And they go to these camps and we, they're, they're learning different skills, like life, between life skills, resume building, um, you know, archery, like all kinds of stuff, you know, outside of music. And then we'll have poetry. And, you know, one year Hallmark sponsored it. And they wrote greeting cards, like just different things just to, you know, improve their literacy, improve you know, mathematical skills and science, everything, but in a fun way for the summer, you know, and just regular physical activity. Like it's a phenomenal, the arc, that camp is really a signature of the program. Um, and we also give away scholarships as well. Um, with DASH, Destined to Achieve Successful Heights, really Jay, uh, Jerome and Michael, the, the co-founders of Mama's Boys Entertainment Group, they went to a funeral. And, you know, the minister said, when you're born, there's a date. When you die, there's a date. What's that dash in the middle? What does that signify? And so they wanted to find, you know, found dash. And luckily they had a young intern come in and really um, help, you know, really develop the curriculum for it. And we focus on the business of music, business of media, um, and the business of sports. And really, fun fact, what no one knows, I was only supposed to um, be an assistant for Sean for one year. At the time, we had, um, we had a grant. We had a planning grant from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation 
to start um, a small high school here in Philly, a uh, business of entertainment high school. And we got all the way up to the school reform uh, committee and we had a public meeting and they put a freeze at the time, Dr. Ackerman, uh, superintendent at the time, put a freeze on charter schools. And so that made us reevaluate what we were doing. I was going to, you know, be running a school and, you know, that made us reevaluate what we were going to do. And so we started becoming an after school program. Um, and then we started going back into the schools and really being a part of their grades as well. Um, so currently, you know, this year, and we've been in existence since 2005. So that's, you know, 16 years. Um, you know, we are in Strawberry Mansion, Amira. We are in, uh, you know, Girls High. We are in Overbrook. Um, and then the district will every year give us other schools that we switch or, or be a part of. We've been in Baltimore. We've worked with CCP and some other uh, Chester um, school district. You know, one of the stats that I'm super proud of is, you know, at Strawberry Mansion, the students that have been in this program for, for two years, their grades across all subjects have improved over 30 percent um and that's something they attribute to to our program you know what i mean and shout out to all the teachers i can't i'll never take credit for that she, carol riddick is our program director um ivan barrius um is our our director of, of production technology crystal oliver um is our director of literacy um we have calvin price critical these are all grammy nominated grammy award-winning songwriters that come in and teach these kids and that's something that you can't you know, really emulate, like we're having people really teach them. And then myself and Jerome and Mike will come in and teach some of the business elements. But Dash is super important. Um, and then um, I believe this will have aired by the time I can say this. If not, we'll cut it out. Um, but we are partnering with uh, the Steve Harvey Foundation to give um, scholarships to multiple schools um, across the district uh, this year. Um, so it's something that, you know, we continue to build, continue to scale. Um, and, and yeah, we, you know, we're developing a curriculum now that can be used for other, um, schools around the country as well. At Vernon, I think you and I are going to have to connect off of like offline of this, because what I do with my actual for-profit job is we give scholarships to students who very much fit in your, the realm that you're working in. And, um, we have a branch in Pennsylvania that we're trying to expand. So okay. We can talk about that, you know, no <laughs> a little bit later. No be super dope. Whenever. Perfect. Perfect. But even even getting into that, like I, I, it's crazy because like I feel like you like Amir has been saying too, like you you touch base in so many spots, so many spots, and, and the fact that it's like the philanthropy philanthropy part, I can't speak today. Wow, uh, the music part, just uh, adjusting throughout the realms of that. And you mentioned before like how COVID has kind of changed everything, mm -hmm. which I think you know is 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 a is a struggle for artists, entrepreneurs, all alike. Um, I wanted to see what you would think. Like, what would you like? What were the three things you would give to somebody? Advice that you would give to you know an up and coming artist about maybe doing a virtual tour. Like, if you had to give them like a like a like a three things to keep in consideration, what would you say? I mean, one, you have to have a core fan base. You know, you can have a, mm -hmm. nobody's watching, nobody. You know, it doesn't matter. So I think it's really building a fan base, social media channels. Um, you know, hopefully you have a, a manager who has relationships with some of the talent bookers in your particular city. And you have to build those. I would say build that audience. I know it's an old school adage because the earth is flat now and you can connect with everyone. But I really do feel wrong. What was so funny? Did you just say the earth is flat and you could connect with everyone? Yeah, because you can't like, <laughs> like internet, like you can do whatever. Um, but I think having that strong uh, local base is still important. You know what I'm saying? Particularly when we come back to live, because um, we will come back at some point. Um, but I will also say, because there are so many independent um, venues that are struggling, you know, yes, Live Nation has lost a lot of money, but Live Nation will be back. AEG has lost a lot of money, but AEG will be back. But it's these independent venues, independent bookers that don't know what to do right now. I would say partner with them, reach out to them, see if they, you know, have an opportunity to to have a show there. There are so many live stream companies, virtual companies that have just popped up since um, COVID started in March, officially for, for the US. Reach out, like do your research, you know, understand what these venues are, understand what these companies are. They need content, you know, Josh, Amira, content is king. We know that, you know what I'm saying? Or can't content is queen as well, you know what I'm saying? Because I'm inclusive. Um, but I think it's important that you just do your research understand all of, you know there are so many different opportunities now um and different methods to get 
music out. But I think it always starts with that core fan base and, and promoting who you are um, as an artist. Yeah. So um, how would you, I, I mean, I'm, all, I'm like always wild. You know what I mean? Sometimes but it's the same way. Like Josh will be like, oh, it's just my friend. And then you hear so much of what people are balancing and doing and the, all their accomplishments, right? What would you define as your legacy? And how do you, you know, do you consider yourself building that legacy? Um, and do you feel, I guess, should I say, do you feel like you're an active part? Because yes, you sought your life as far as it going into entertainment. And mm -hmm. then you took advantage of the opportunities that came in front of you, right? But do you feel like you're actively building it? Um, mm -hmm. you know. if, if I do what I hope to do, this music, all of this music, and this entertainment piece is is a is a launching pad to to what that legacy will be. This sounds very only childish and very light skin. What I'm about to say, I'm just going to be honest. I when I was like, and this is something I've said to people, and I shouldn't even say this out loud. I was like, if I don't get a holiday, that I haven't done enough for Black people country and, and and let me be real because i was like you see how stevie fought and sung that song that we only know part of um and fought for martin to have a holiday you want to know why because martin was really working they wouldn't give x a holiday because of who he was and what he stood for they wouldn't give certain other of our leaders that type of thing we don't and i and i'm speaking for myself i don't speak enough about what those inequalities are about the things that we've gone through and maybe i just saw one night in Miami and I just saw, you know, Judas and the Black Messiah and it's reinvigorated me. But motherfuckers fought for things, right? Like, it's cute, we decent. Like we be on Instagram like, nah, this shit wrong, fuck that. No, people were fighting for things. Like Fred Hampton, I was just joking about this with somebody else. Fred Hampton was 21 looking 51 because he was going through some things, some real life, stuff real yeah. life so for me i hope i can be a leader that steps up in act two or act three of my life and to enough or motivate enough change where you know we're, we're talking about you know slimming down that educational inequalities that we have you know there are only two percent of of teachers in, in public high schools are black males whereas you know X amount of percent, 40, 50, 60% of, you know, public high school students are black and black males. That's a disparity that needs to be corrected. There are economic inequalities. When you look at everything and all of this is connected. When you have a poor education, economically, you're not gonna get sound, which means you're not gonna be able to buy a house, which means you're not gonna be able to have property, which means you're not gonna be able to have something to leave as a legacy for, for the people behind you for your kids and for your grandkids and then that is just duplicated and replicated and we know that certain neighborhoods are an experiment and we are in the thick of it and so I think that for me legacy isn't about how many tickets you know fill in the blank rap artists sold you know what I'm saying it isn't about um I think it's gonna be more about the dashes um and and the blues babes but more than that I, I just I really want us to get to the point where I think we're so, when it comes to like struggle, as much as we like to say black people aren't monolithic, I, I will argue that we are right now because we don't, we're, we're all over the place. And we don't have that, like, you know, you saw what the, what the enemy, what the, what the fight was. I think that's what it is. We saw what the fight was, you know, 1600s through, you know, 1965. You know, I don't know who listened to your podcast, but once we got integrated, it all went to shit. And because if you go back, it wasn't just the Tulsa's of the world. There were so many black Wall Streets. There were so many black thriving communities in this country. Um, you know, and there were so many things that we were doing that were positive, that were great. And we're doing great things now. Be clear, we're doing phenomenal. But the wealth gap has still, you know, widened. Um, the educational gap has still widened. So there's a lot more individuals who are doing great, but overall, Black people are still in a bad place. So long-winded thought, 
but I would love to my legacy be like, oh shit, like he really helped to to he really helped to save black culture. And that's a very fucking light skin same thing to say. Like save black culture. Shut up. But also that's what I'm striving to do. And and I think it's, you know, through mediums like, you know, media, Josh, you know what I mean? With with you working on films and working on content, those pieces of content can make change. There's someone watching Judas and the Black Messiah that didn't know who Fred Hampton was that's probably going to do some research and understand their history a little bit more. There's someone watching One Night in Miami that didn't understand that Malcolm could befriend Jim Brown and Sam Cooke. Understand that Sam Cooke had a fucking record label and owned publishing on the Beatles. No one knew. People didn't know that. And so I think that it's important for us. And that's why, you know, I haven't, I've been talking this time because I'm an interviewee, but Josh, I, you know, I commend you, Amira, I commend you because I think working in certain aspects of media and content allow us to, to have an eye for things and more people are watching things and more people are observant to things now. Um, but I still think that we are, we are all over the place and we're so distrustful of black leadership. Um, and so I think that we have to get back to the place where we can, there is, we might need a singular, a couple people where we can like, all right, let's follow what they say because we don't have that right now. Yeah, I think um, I agree. Uh, one of the biggest things America does is it pushes people into hyper individualism yeah. where we are all so focused on our own individual pursuit. And then we see things like the pandemic come and ravage us and it won't leave because we are hyper individuals. You can't tell me what to do. But then we see other companies, I mean, other countries such as Korea and parts of Asia where they're very homogenous. They're yeah. about, we are all a community. We're all the same people. And we got to do what's best for the greater good of our people. But um, I mean, we're, we're so many people. So uh, this is a good episode. I'm just saying, yeah. I'm, I, I just even, I just wanted to touch on the fact that even like, I feel like as black creatives now in the media room that I've seen, I've seen so much more collaboration with black people just because I feel like a lot of the people that I know who are working in the film world, and shout out to my friend Alex, who I hope to get on this show very soon. Yeah. But she just got a huge job at uh, uh, Bad Robot as a VP of television. Oh. And she's going to be amazing. Yeah. Crazy, crazy, crazy. Yeah, JJ April. But, um, just people are now like unifying and telling stories and being very proud to like, you know, have these conversations yeah. and even put their stories out there. You know what I mean? Like black content is, is incredible and we can do incredible things with our stories, our words, our emotions, you know, the things that we convey. So it's incredible to see kind of what that's gonna become and how that's gonna become. Like you said before, I think we're now, I think the pandemic mm -hmm. helped a lot, but it helped unify our vision of what we need to have happen. You know what I mean? Like it's, it's, it's a, there was a lot of, the integration definitely like, it, it made people content, you know what I'm saying? We get we, we got something that we kind of wanted, but now we're, we're kind of saying, okay, you know, the mm -hmm. work isn't done yet. And we need people who have the voices to say the things mm -hmm. that they need to say. And if you're up and coming, continue to share your stories, continue to say the things that you I, need to say. You know what I mean? Those stories. I agree. I think, we, I agree. I think we're still trying to attain what is perceived as white success. Um, our own sort of, you know, communal community type success. And even with the pandemic last year, I mean, we're still in it, but even with last year, when we saw what happened with George Floyd and we saw what happened with Breonna Taylor and when, you know, we saw all this, you know, revolution, all these companies did was say, all right, I'm going to put some money behind it. You know, here's a hundred million dollars and you keep investing. Here's a hundred million you know, black guy, go, you know, go be black. Um, but like, what are we doing? Like, what are we doing now? I feel like all that momentum we saw, you know, we blackouts and this and that now, you know, February, people don't even know it's black history. Month, I don't think, you know what I'm saying? Like, what are we doing now? Like, what's the, what's tangible? What's next? And so that's why I think, you know, what, one of the biggest things this is actually, I think this is the truth, but like, our greatest export is creativity. You know, our creative economy is 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 what makes this makes the, I'll say North America what makes it thrive. And so I think now, with us to your point, Josh, collaborating, being together, let's put out the shit. Let's put out content for us, and let's let's build, man. But we still, I still see it often. It's too many execs, you know. And I'm talking to black execs who they don't want to lose their position or help the next person get up to be an exec because they're the cool. They're the or there or the you know black woman they're the one that all the white people or other people in the room respect so they don't want to 
bring on anybody else. And we got it. We have to get out of it. It's a mentality, but it's a mentality that's, you know, been driven since slavery, where colorism also comes in, where, you know, a lot of the things that we go through um, still stem from that. But I, you know, I'm going on a whole different dissertation. So I don't, you know, I'll stop. Music. Thank you. Thank you, preacher. <laughs> but you, but it's true. Even with nonprofits, people don't want to solve the problem to the point that they put themselves out of a job a lot of times. But hopefully that's mm -hmm. the goal, right? Yeah. Hopefully that's the goal. If I could solve the societal issue so that my nonprofit doesn't need to exist anymore, that's like, I would say that would be success, right? Um, so do, do you want to ask the big question or should we say, okay, you know gonna, what, you, wanna, gonna, just, you, you talk about a lot. I was have you ever wanted to, have you ever wanted to quit yes okay. and what, what pushed you how'd you get through it and like how how often did you want to quit <laughs> who watches this um, <laughs> <laughs> um <laughs> it was probably like every day i was tired of dealing with artists i was tired of to 3 a.m. calls. I was tired of just dealing with people. And it made me, you know, it's it's part of the reason why, like, you know, if I, you know, if I'm ever in some sort of relationship or or I'm talking to somebody where I don't want to, you know, they're excited to talk and, and talk. And I just be wanting to chill. Like at the end of the day, I've talked to 80 million people and I just want to relax. I just want to like get my mind right so in those moments when I was like I'm, I'm done with this I want to quit like I want to and part of that is just me like I just want to be on work for myself where I have the final decision where I'm where I'm calling every shot um because I know there's still work to that, that was, there was a lot of frustration this was years ago though I'm completely happy and content now um in case anyone's watching and uh you know what I'm saying this was years ago so um you know um I, I just think that I'll get to that point, right? We all, I think we all sometimes reach breaking points. You know what I'm saying? No matter where we're at or what we're doing because work, you know, I, I don't even like the word, um, you know, work-life balance. Nah, it's just your life balance and work is a part of it. Like that's, we've already put work before your life and that's what we've done. And that, you know, that ain't it. That That's not it. Even though the work is important, I think your health is more important. I think happiness is more important. I think it's a lot easier to be happy when you got a couple of dollars in your pocket. I, I will say that it's a lot easier to be happy. You can be happy having a good time, but at the same time, you can't enjoy it if you are depressed or you are sad or you are out because you don't want to go outside because you, you are miserable on the inside. So I think there has to be some sort of, um, you know, self-evaluation on who you are and what you want to do. Um, but yeah, I haven't thought about quitting in a long time. That's the good stuff. I was going to say, you mentioned before, like, you know, this being the current stage you're at in your life and that, you know, the next chapter, you want to be able to to, to really kind of work on it, giving back. Mm -hmm. But since you're at this current chapter, what do you think would be the best album or mixtape to define where you are right now in your current chapter of life? Sure. Um, best album or mixtape? Um, Blueprint, just because. <laughs> One, that was two, easy. or three. One. One. I would that was the quickest answer ever. Two songs that popped up when I said that were Heart of the City and All I Need. Because that's for real. You know what I mean? I think we all need to have that 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 core group of people that are going to have your back no matter what you go through. All I need is the love of my crew. The whole industry can hate me and I'll thug my way through that bitch. And that's the truth. And then Heart of the City, I just feel like we be hating on each other too much for no reason. And I think we have to get out of again, but this is a mentality that's hundreds of years in the making. So it's it's we're programmed certain ways. Um, so I, I think that we just need to, um, you know, to your point, Josh. Let's you know let's continue with that collaboration. Let's continue working together because you know we are all we got. You know, at the end of the day, and and I think we have to start recognizing that um, in a real serious way. Absolutely, I mean, I'm gonna let you ask the big question for this. Oh, Oh yeah. So the question we're all at, at wondering. <laughs> so the question is um where where our title is disruptors in the culture. And you know, anything that's a disruption is a break from the norm, the energy flow, 
whatever was the status quo or the way things are or the state of being, and then there's a disruption, right? What does it mean to you to be a disruptor? Um, it, it, it means to me what it's always meant for me. Maybe I didn't know the word back then or understand the meaning, but it's, it's, it's beyond going against the grain because we all, you know, if you look at society as a whole, it's very structured. It's, you know, you go to school for 13, 14, you know, go to pre-K 14 years, and then you have to go to college. And then schools are built like, you know, these insulated places. Some look like prisons, depending on where you live. Some look lush if you live in certain areas, but they're these insulated areas that don't have a lot of fresh, don't have a lot of open space. So now you're conditioned to just work in these types of fields. And then you go into college. And then if you go to college, then you're, you know, there are some people that go on to, to even more school and they get more degrees and then they're, they're coming out of it. Um, and then you're working. And then a lot of people, majority of people in this country are working nine to five. And then that's their life. And you hope, you hope to find a partner and you hope to have some kids and you hope for the best. And you're living a very mundane, redundant life. You know, what takes redundancy out of your life? What are the things go out now and you're catching an Uber versus, you know, having to take a taxi? You know, these are, you know, or you're at an Airbnb because you don't have to worry about a hotel. These are things, I think disruption comes from times that are really bad. And, and what I mean by that is like 08, 09, we were at our, you know, lowest economic downturn, you know, in a long time in this country. That was the birth of Uber. That was the birth of Airbnb. That was the birth of a lot of things that are now these multi-billion dollar companies now. And so I think coming out of this pandemic, what it means to be a disruptor is taking your, 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 your mindset is how do I make change in a system that is not you know, really prone to a lot of change. You see a lot of technolo technological changes and things like that, but I'm talking about overall systematic, uh, systemic, excuse me, thinking. How do I change that? As a disruptor, I want to change how you actually fucking perceive life. And I think that's something very difficult. That's something that, you know, will someone actually achieve that at, at the highest form when they, before they die? I don't think so. But I think that that comes in different ways. Disruption comes in revolution. Disruption comes in, you know, how you treat your family, how you treat a woman, how, how you or, or a partner. You know what I'm saying? Like, you know, why? Why can we get to a place where we're not talking about toxic, 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 toxic relationships or any of that? Like disruption comes in different ways, big, small and in between, like, you know, and I just try to you try to try to live better every day. Some shit disrupt, disrupt your own life. Rick James, I don't know. Like, <laughs> well, that was that was that was that's great. I mean, like that's like again, like I was saying before, that's what we kind of want to highlight, and we really do feel like Brandon, you're 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 doing that, regardless of the of how you feel like you may or may not be, like from how you got to where you are to what you're doing now to what you plan on doing. You've already disrupted the game, made the made made it completely different, and have found ways to continue to share that knowledge now. And we appreciate you coming and sharing it with our audience and and passing on a game and just sharing your experiences because the people that listen need to hear this information yes. for sure. Definitely um, for sure. Now, thank y'all for having me. You know, I didn't think I was worthy to be a part of this. Thank you, Amir, for, for inviting me and making me feel like I'm somebody in this world. Thank you. Now, we definitely appreciate that, and Amir. <laughs> thank you so much <laughs> for getting me on here. And, the um, king. This is like the king of self-deprecation. Like, cut it out. <laughs> okay. <laughs> no, for real. Like, we we really do appreciate that, and we hope that you know when when this when COVID all dies down, we can get you know follow up with you more and see what's going on. But um, for sure. Uh, thank you again for everybody for listening to um disruptors in the culture, and please check us out again. You can check us on YouTube, our Instagram, uh, Twitter, everywhere on social media. Check us out, and um, yeah. We'll follow up with more information later. Cool. Hey, this is Amira Smith, co-host of the Disruptors in the Culture podcast. You could be anywhere in the world right now on any video in the world, but you're here watching us. Thank you. Like, subscribe, and share. Check out our next episode. Tell us what you think in the comments.